Autobiography of Anthony Trollope. Chapter 2. My Mother. Though I do not wish in these pages to go back to the origin of all the Trollopes, I must say a few words of my mother, partly because filial duty will not allow me to be silent as to a parent who made for herself a considerable name in the literature of her day, and partly because there were circumstances in her career well worthy of notice. She was the daughter of Reverend William Milton, vicar of Heckfield, who as well as my father had been a fellow of New College. She was nearly thirty when, in 1809, she married my father. Six or seven years ago a bundle of love letters from her to him fell into my hand in a very singular way, having been found in the house of a stranger, who, with much courtesy, sent them to me. They were then about sixty years old, and had been written some before and some after her marriage, over the space of perhaps a year. In no novel of Richardson's or Miss Burney's have I seen a correspondence at the same time so sweet, so graceful, and so well expressed. But the marvel of these letters was in the strange difference they bore to the love letters of the present day. They are, all of them, on square paper, folded and sealed, and addressed to my father on circuit. But the language in each, though it almost borders on the romantic, is beautifully chosen, and fit, without change of a syllable, for the most critical eye. What girl now studies the words with which she shall address her lover, or seeks to charm him with grace of diction? She dearly likes a little slang, and revels in the luxury of entire familiarity with a new and strange being. There's something in that, too, pleasant to our thoughts, but I fear that this phase of life does not conduce to a taste for poetry among our girls. Though my mother was a writer of prose and reveled in satire, the poetic feeling clung to her to the last. In the first ten years of her married life she became the mother of six children, four of whom died of consumption at different ages. My elder sister married and had children, of whom one still lives, but she was one of the four who followed each other at intervals during my mother's lifetime. Then my brother Tom and I were left to her with the destiny before us three of writing more books than were probably ever before produced by a single family. Footnote. The family of Estienne, the great French printers of the 15th and 16th centuries, of whom there were at least nine or ten, did more, perhaps, for the production of literature than any other family. But they, though they edited, and not unfrequently translated the works which they published, were not authors in the ordinary sense. My married sister added to the number by one little anonymous high church story called Cullerton. From the date of their marriage up to 1827, when my mother went to America, my father's affairs had always been going down in the world. She had loved society, affecting a somewhat liberal role and professing an emotional dislike to tyrants, which sprung from the wrongs of would-be regicides and the poverty of patriot exiles. An Italian marquis, who had escaped with only a second shirt from the clutches of some archduke whom he had wished to exterminate, or a French proletaire with distant ideas of sacrificing himself to the cause of liberty, were always welcome in the modest hospitality of her house. In after years, when marquises of another caste had been gracious to her, she became a strong Tory, and thought that archduchesses were sweet but with her politics were always an affair of the heart, as indeed were all her convictions. Of reasoning from causes I think she knew nothing. Her heart was in every way so perfect, her desire to do good to all around her so thorough, and her power of self-sacrifice so complete that she generally got herself right in spite of her want of logic. But it must be acknowledged that she was emotional. I can remember now her books, and can see her at her pursuits. The poets she loved best were Dante and Spencer, but she raved also of him of whom all such ladies were raving then, and rejoiced in the popularity and wept over the persecution of Lord Byron. She was among those who seized with avidity on the novels, as they came out, of the then unknown Scott, and who could still talk of the triumphs of Miss Edgeworth. 
with the literature of the day she was familiar and with the poets of the past of other reading i do not think she had mastered much her life i take it though latterly clouded by many troubles was easy luxurious and idle till my father's affairs and her own aspirations sent her to america she had dear friends among literary people of whom i remember matthias henry milman and miss landon but till long after middle life she never herself wrote a line for publication in eighteen twenty seven she went to america having been partly instigated by the social and communistic ideas of a lady whom i well remember a certain miss wright who was i think the first of the american female lecturers her chief desire however was to establish my brother henry and perhaps joined with that was the additional object of breaking up her english home without pleading broken fortunes to all the world at cincinnati in the state of ohio she built a bazaar and i fancy lost all the money which may have been embarked in that speculation it could not have been much and i think that others also must have suffered but she looked about her at her american cousins and resolved to write a book about them this book she brought back with her in eighteen thirty one and published it early in eighteen thirty two when she did this she was already fifty when doing this she was aware that unless she could so succeed in making money there was no money for any of the family she had never before earned a shilling she almost immediately received a considerable sum from the publishers if i remember rightly amounting to two sums of four hundred pounds each within a few months and from that moment till nearly the time of her death at any rate for more than twenty years she was in the receipt of a considerable income from her writings it was a late age at which to begin such a career the domestic manners of the americans was the first of a series of books of travels of which it was probably the best and was certainly the best known it will not be too much to say of it that it had a material effect upon the manners of the americans of the day and that that effect has been fully appreciated by them no observer was certainly ever less qualified to judge of the prospects or even of the happiness of a young people no one could have been worse adapted by nature for the task of learning whether a nation was in a way to thrive whatever she saw she judged as most women do from her own standing point if a thing were ugly to her eyes it ought to be ugly to all eyes and if ugly it must be bad what though people had plenty to eat and clothes to wear if they put their feet upon the tables and did not reverence their betters the americans were to her rough uncouth and vulgar and she told them so those communistic and social ideas which had been so pretty in a drawing-room were scattered to the winds her volumes were very bitter but they were very clever and they saved the family from ruin book followed book immediately first two novels and then a book on belgium and western germany she refurnished the house which i have called orley farm and surrounded us again with moderate comforts of the mixture of joviality and industry which formed her character it is almost impossible to speak with exaggeration the industry was a thing apart kept to herself it was not necessary that any one who lived with her should see it she was at her table at four in the morning and had finished her work before the world had begun to be aroused but the joviality was all for others she could dance with other people's legs eat and drink with other people's palates be proud with the luster of other people's finery every mother can do that for her own daughters but she could do it for any girl whose look and voice and manners pleased her even when she was at work the laughter of those she loved was a pleasure to her she had much very much to suffer Work sometimes came hard to her, so much being required, for she was extravagant, and liked to have money to spend. But of all people I have known, she was the most joyous, or, at any rate, the most capable of joy. We continued this renewed life at Harrow for nearly two years, during which I was still at the school, and at the end of which I was nearly nineteen. Then there came a great catastrophe 
my father who when he was well lived a sad life among his monks and nuns still kept a horse and gig one day in march eighteen thirty four just as it had been decided that i should leave the school then instead of remaining as it had been intended till midsummer i was summoned very early in the morning to drive him up to london he had been ill and must still have been very ill indeed when he submitted to be driven by any one it was not till we had started that he told me that i was to put him on board the ostend boat this i did driving him through the city down to the docks it was not within his nature to be communicative and to the last he never told me why he was going to ostend something of a general flitting abroad i had heard before but why should he have flown first and flown so suddenly i did not in the least know till i returned when i got back with the gig the house and furniture were all in the charge of the sheriff's officers the gardener who had been with us in former days stopped me as i drove up the road and with gestures signs and whispered words gave me to understand that the whole affair horse gig and barness would be made prize of if i went but a few yards further why they should not have been made prize of i do not know the little piece of dishonest business which i at once took in hand and carried through successfully was of no special service to any of us i drove the gig into the village and sold the entire equipage to the ironmonger for seventeen pounds the exact sum which he claimed as being due to himself i was much complimented by the gardener who seemed to think that so much had been rescued out of the fire i fancy that the ironmonger was the only gainer by my smartness when i got back to the house a scene of devastation was in progress which still was not without its amusement my mother through her various troubles had contrived to keep a certain number of pretty pretties which were dear to her heart they were not much for in those days the ornamentation of houses was not lavish as it is now but there was some china and a little glass a few books and a very moderate supply of household silver these things and things like them were being carried down surreptitiously through a gap between the two gardens on the premises of our friend colonel grant my two sisters then sixteen and seventeen and the grant girls who were just younger were the chief marauders to such forces i was happy to add myself for any enterprise and between us we cheated the creditors to the extent of our powers amidst the anathemas but good-humoured abstinence from personal violence of the men in charge of the property i still own a few books that were thus purloined for a few days the whole family bivouacked under the colonel's hospitable roof cared for and comforted by that dearest of all women his wife then we followed my father to belgium and established ourselves in a large house just outside the walls of bruges at this time until my father's death everything was done with money earned by my mother she now again furnished the house this being the third that she had put in order since she came back from america two and a half years ago there were six of us went into this new banishment my brother henry had left cambridge and was ill my younger sister was ill and though as yet we hardly told each other that it was so we began to feel that desolating friend consumption was among us my father was broken-hearted as well as ill but whenever he could sit at his table he still worked at his ecclesiastical records my elder sister and i were in good health but i was an idle desolate hanger-on that most hopeless of human beings a hobbledehoy of nineteen without any idea of a career or a profession or a trade as well as i can remember i was fairly happy for there were pretty girls in bruges with whom i could fancy that i was in love and i had been removed from the real misery of school but as to my future life i had not even an aspiration now and again there would arise a feeling that it was hard upon my mother that she should have to do so much for us that we should be idle while she was forced to work so constantly but we should probably have thought more of that had she not taken to work as though it were the recognized condition of life for an old lady of fifty-five then by degrees 
an established sorrow was at home among us. My brother was an invalid, and the horrid word, which of all words were for some years after the most dreadful to us, had been pronounced. It was no longer a delicate chest and some temporary necessity for peculiar care, but consumption. The Bruges doctor had said so, and we knew that he was right. From that time forth my mother's most visible occupation was that of nursing. There were two sick men in the house, and hers were the hands that tended them. The novels went on, of course. We had already learned to know that they would be forthcoming at stated intervals, and they always were forthcoming. The doctor's vials and the ink bottle held equal places in my mother's rooms. I have written many novels under many circumstances, but I doubt much whether I could write one when my whole heart was by the bedside of a dying son. Her power of dividing herself into two parts, and keeping her intellect by itself clear from the troubles of the world, and fit for the duty it had to do, I never saw equaled. I do not think that the writing of a novel is the most difficult task which a man may be called upon to do, but it is a task that may be supposed to demand a spirit fairly at ease. The work of doing it with a troubled spirit killed Sir Walter Scott. My mother went through it unscathed in strength, though she performed all the work of day nurse and night nurse to a sick household, for there were soon three of them dying. At this time there came from some quarter an offer to me of a commission in an Austrian cavalry regiment, and so it was apparently my destiny to be a soldier. But I must first learn German and French, of which languages I knew almost nothing. For this a year was allowed me, and in order that it might be accomplished without expense, I undertook the duties of a classical usher to a school then kept by William Drury at Brussels. Mr. Drury had been one of the masters at Harrow when I went there at seven years old, and is now, after an interval of fifty-three years, even yet officiating as clergyman at that place. Footnote. He died two years after these words were written. To Brussels I went, and my heart still sinks within me as I reflect that any one should have entrusted to me the tuition of thirty boys. I can only hope that those boys went there to learn French, and that their parents were not particular as to their classical acquirements. I remember that on two occasions I was sent to take the school out for a walk, but that after the second attempt Mrs. Drury declared that the boys' clothes would not stand any further experiments of that kind. I cannot call to mind any learning by me of other languages but as I only remained in that position for six weeks, perhaps the return lessons had not been as yet commenced. At the end of the six weeks, a letter reached me, offering me a clerkship in the general post office, and I accepted it. Among my mother's dearest friends, she reckoned Mrs. Freeling, the wife of Clayton Freeling, whose father, Sir Francis Freeling, then ruled the post office. She had heard of my desolate position, and had begged from her father-in-law the offer of a berth in his own office. I hurried back from Brussels to Bruges on my way to London, and found that the number of invalids had been increased. My younger sister Emily, who when I had left the house was trembling on the balance, who had been pronounced to be delicate but with that false-tongued hope which knows the truth, but will lie lest the heart should faint, had been called delicate, but only delicate, was now ill. Of course she was doomed. I knew it of both of them, though I had never heard the word spoken, or had spoken it to any one. And my father was very ill, ill to dying, though I did not know it. And my mother had decreed to send my elder sister away to England, thinking that the vicinity of so much sickness might be injurious to her. All this happened late in the autumn of 1834, in the spring of which year we had come to Bruges. And then my mother was left alone in a big house outside the town, with two Belgian women servants to nurse these dying patients, the patients being her husband and children, and to write novels for the sustenance of the family. 
It was about this period of her career that her best novels were written. To my own initiation at the post office, I will return in the next chapter. Just before Christmas, my brother died and was buried at Bruges. In the following February, my father died and was buried alongside of him, and with him died that tedious task of his, which I can only hope may have solaced many of his latter hours. I sometimes look back, meditating for hours together, on his adverse fate. He was a man, finely educated, of great parts, with immense capacity for work, physically strong, very much beyond the average of men, addicted to no vices, carried off by no pleasures, affectionate by nature, most anxious for the welfare of his children, born to fair fortunes, who, when he started in the world, may be said to have had everything at his feet. But everything went wrong with him. The touch of his hand seemed to create failure. He embarked in one hopeless enterprise after another, spending on each all the money he could at the time command. But the worst curse to him of all was a temper so irritable that even those whom he loved the best could not endure it. We were all estranged from him, and yet I believe that he would have given his heart's blood for any of us. His life as I knew it was one long tragedy. After his death, my mother moved to England and took and furnished a small house at Hadley near Barnet. I was then a clerk in the London post office, and I remember well how gay she made the place with little dinners, little dances, and little picnics, while she herself was at work every morning long before others had left their beds. But she did not stay at Hadley much above a year. She went up to London, where she again took and furnished a house, from which my remaining sister was married and carried away into Cumberland. My mother soon followed her, and on this occasion did more than take a house. She bought a bit of land, a field of three acres near the town, and built a residence for herself. This, I think, was in 1841, and she had thus established and re-established herself six times in ten years. But in Cumberland she found the climate too severe, and in 1844 she moved herself to Florence, where she remained till her death in 1863. She continued writing up to 1854, when she was 76 years old, and had at that time produced 114 volumes, of which the first was not written till she was 50. Her career offers great encouragement to those who have not begun early in life, but are still ambitious to do something before they depart hence. She was an unselfish, affectionate, and most industrious woman, with great capacity for enjoyment and high physical gifts. She was endowed, too, with much creative power, with considerable humor, and a genuine feeling for romance. But she was neither clear-sighted nor accurate and in her attempts to describe morals, manners, and even facts, was unable to avoid the pitfalls of... End of chapter 2